Hello, my name is Kate Robinson. I am the head gardener here at the Charter House and welcome to our Flower Power Festival. Uh, I'm here with Miko and Charlotte. Just going to quickly say hi. <laughs> and hi. We're bringing you this uh, fabulous festival celebrating the power of flowers for health, happiness and well-being. Um, we're coming to you live from the Charter House. For those of you who don't know about us, we are um, a historic site, seven acres, uh, on the edge of the City of London in Clerkenwell. Um, we were a monastery in the 14th century and since then have been a Tudor mansion, a boys boarding school and an almshouse, which we are to this day. And now a little bit about Ellen Mary. She is uh, a garden lover since she was a child, enjoying her parents' garden in Norfolk. Um, she has established Ellen Mary Gardening, uh, writing and broadcasting about gardening and growing your own food and to promote how nature and garden, gardening can benefit your well-being. Um, and that's what she's going to be talking about today. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing what she's got to say. So welcome, Ellen. If she's there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. The most important question of all. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a total pleasure to be here to chat with you about gardening and nature and well-being, my favourite topic. And uh, that was a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. But I thought I would just very quickly run through how I got to this point of um, basically broadcasting, if you like, and talking about how important nature is for our well-being. So um, as uh, we've just said, I have been a garden lover ever since I was a child. My parents did have a kitchen garden and my uncle, he also had a beautiful organic kitchen garden at the back of his old house. And when I was little, I used to go and pick the caterpillars off his cabbages and we used to put them into a jar and I have no idea what happened to them after that point. I don't like to think about it, <laughs> but just being outside, you know, amongst vegetables and understanding where our food came from at a really young age was just uh, so good and I was hooked really and I can always remember sitting down the end of our garden and we had lots of peas growing and I used to pinch the peas out of their pods because that's when they taste the best don't they <laughs> definitely and I think I might have been the only child at kind of pre-age two who actually enjoyed gooseberries as well. I used to absolutely love them and we had a big blue shed and I used to sit on the step and my parents always used to say, whatever you do, you are not allowed into that shed. So up until I was about seven, never go in that shed. That's not for you to go to. And, you know, I just used to think that fairies lived there. <laughs> I still like to think that fairies live there, really. However, later I did find out it's because my dad was brewing his own beer. But, you know, <laughs> so I've always been out there in the garden. And before I carry on, I must just tell you, I'm in my home at the moment, so working from home, I'm also dog sitting. I've closed the curtains uh, so that anyone walking past, the dogs don't bark at. But if there's any noise in the background, I apologise uh, right now. Uh, so, yeah, as I got older, I decided that um, I wanted to work in horticulture. And I can remember going to my careers teacher and she said, well, what do you what do you want to do? And I said, well, I don't really know what I want to do, but I love plants. And she looked through her book and uh, she said, oh, she said, well, you could be a teacher or a nurse. And I remember thinking, okay, so obviously horticulture is not an industry that I can go and work in. And um, so I ended up working in HR. But you know, HR was really, really good experience. It was working with people. Um, and I learned so many skills that I later brought into horticulture. I never stopped working in gardening. I took my RHS qualifications, uh, distance learning and part time. And then I started to do other people's gardens. And in the end, I realized life is just way too short to not be doing something that you're just really, really passionate about. And it's really important to say that if you love gardening and you love horticulture and you are stuck in a career and you would like to change it, perhaps it's not horticulture, but something else, you know, it, do it. I can't can't say that enough it's so very good for your well-being i have never been happier since i've been working in horticulture so whilst all this is going on i have my own gardens and my own allotment and at the end of the days where i worked in the office i would go to the allotment and i i, I kind of felt like it just helped me to reset so 
I would go back into the office the next day and feel ready, you know, to tackle that day. And then I'd go back to the allotment in the evening and reset. And the more I worked in the garden and the more I needed to be outside in the garden because I'd been in the office all day, the more I decided I wanted to find out why I felt so good when I gardened. You know, why did I reset? What was it that was making me feel like this? So that's when my research started into well-being and you know how good it is for our mental and physical well-being to be outside with nature and in turn that turned into writing for magazines i travel all over the world to talk about the benefits of plants and nature for well-being i have my first book being released next spring which is really exciting i have a radio show and a podcast and basically my whole life is about plants i even eat a plant-based diet because of course that's also really good for well-being and the planet as well so i like to think that i am a living breathing plant <laughs> i'm a human plant <laughs> so yeah i decided that it was time to look much, much deeper into why humans have this intrinsic link to the natural world. What is it that makes us feel so good? Kind of the science behind it. And when I was looking into, you know, the theories and all the reasons why we believe that it's so good for us. I found something called earthing. Um, it's also known as grounding. Uh, if any of you have heard of it, say in the, you know, pop it in the chat and tell us uh, how you ground or earth yourself. But earthing is basically the state of being connected to our planet. And we live on this amazing, big, beautiful planet and it's full of natural energy. It's vibrating in a subtle way all of the time. Whilst we can't feel it, it's there all around us. But did you know that our planet is actually the equivalent of a six sextillion ton rechargeable battery? So that's quite amazing in itself. And it's constantly being recharged by solar power, by the hot molten core, by thunderstorms, like all of that lightning. It's constantly keeping our planet turning. And the planet that we live on, of course, therefore gives life to every single living being on this earth, every organ organism, and that is people, it's fish, it's animals, it's viruses, it's everything. We are all part of the planet. So I think without even getting into the science behind it just yet, I think it's only obvious, really, when you think about it like that way, that we would feel good when we're with our actual natural environment because we are nature and we forget that. We think that we are another species. We think that we are bigger or beyond all of the other species on the planet. But actually, we're all connected. We are all interlinked and we all keep the world turning. So, yeah, we've become quite disconnected from um, that incredible source of all life you know we're very busy in our world we're very digitally collect connected and actually it's been amazing to have this digital connection throughout the pan pandemic and amazing to see how many people have started to enjoy gardening as well and getting outside with nature because when our lives calm down and we're not distracted by all the other millions of things that we have to do what we actually want to do is be with nature we want to go outside we want to garden we want to connect with plants we want fresh air and so the pandemic if there is any benefit from having something so awful happen it is hopefully many more people have discovered that link to the natural world so actually our bodies are uh, bioelectrical so we're not often taught that very much but our bioelectrical system is what keeps our body in balance. It's what keeps inflammation reduced as well. And when we come into contact with the planet, so when we earth ourselves or ground ourselves, we are actually giving our bodies, receiving the natural negative charge from the planet. And that brings our bioelectrical system into balance and it can actually reduce inflammation, so chronic diseases. And that's all from stepping outside on your lawn or gardening, that kind of thing. So there's many kind of diseases that have an um, inflammatory um, aspect to them. Things like allergies, things like asthma, um, cancers, arthritis, kidney disease, all kinds of things. 
And we can actually really reduce that inflammation by purely being outside and earthing ourselves. And I just find that completely and utterly incredible. So that planet full of electricity has got so much more connection to us than we've ever really realized. And actually it's only been up until recent that of course DNA, we know that DNA is our body's blueprint, isn't it? And we've never really thought that it could change, but the earthing theory has proven otherwise. So it's actually shown that there are some genes that respond in some cases to your natural environment. And what's even bigger than that is we're currently now researching into whether those changed genes, those altered genes can actually be passed on through the generations. So earthing is incredibly important um, for our bodies and for future generations. We must calm down. We must be able to connect with the natural planet. So it's not just for us. It's for wildlife. Uh, it's for all species to do that. So what can we do to ground ourselves? We'll get to gardening because obviously that's one way, amazing way that we can ground ourselves. Um, but one way, of course, is forest bathing. So have any of you, do tell us in the chat box, have any of you ever been forest bathing? And don't worry, it doesn't mean that you need to wear a bathing suit. <laughs> you don't need to put on your swimming trunks or your bikini and go and walk in the forest. <laughs> it never ceases to amaze me how so many humans have a total disregard for trees because without trees we basically couldn't breathe we wouldn't be alive without them so you know trees aren't on this planet just for our taking they're part of us we breathe in the oxygen from the trees and in return the trees absorb the carbon dioxide that we breathe out and so on we need them and they need us so Studies in Japan have actually measured uh, changes in immune markers and stress horm hormones in people who regularly walk in forests. And we've actually found out that it can reduce uh, your blood pressure, it can reduce stress and anxiety, it can even reduce allergies, and that's all from walking amongst trees. So they've also found out that people who have um, diabetes, but who are not taking insulin, have found a substantial um, benefit to lowering their blood sugar levels just from going for a walk amongst trees. So basically forest bathing is, uh, it's a leisurely walk for health benefits. So you will of course be absorbing all of that goodness when you're out walking the dogs or you're walking through woodlands with friends. But actually, it's even more important and more effective if you are going for the purpose of health benefits. So if you're going on your own or with someone else and you are just walking amongst the trees and breathing really deeply and relaxing and feeling your blood pressure lower. It's absolutely beautiful. And the more you can do it, the better as well. Uh, so yeah, forest bathing is one of my absolute favorite activities to do. Now, when you are outside forest bathing, have any of you ever hugged a tree? I know, I know, are you going, yeah, I can see some waving there. Um, hugging trees is one of the most precious things that you can do. We have to be very careful, of course, not to step or ruin any of that delicate area beneath the tree, which is full of life. But actually coming into contact with trees is an amazing way to earth ourselves. And it helps to bring that bioelectrical system I was talking about into balance. Now, a tree hugger, of course, was once known as someone who was a hippie. Um, and that was because there was someone a long time ago who chained himself to a tree um, to try and stop the trees in their village from being cut down. And she was a hippie. It was in the 70s. And so it became known as a hippie um, activity. But actually, tree hugging is just it's more than that. An actual tree hugger is someone who is fanatical about nature. And well, that's me. I'm fanatical about nature and I'm an outright tree hugger. <laughs> you can call me any names you like. Um, but yeah, tree hugging actually brings our body back into balance. So we vibrate, the planet's vibrating, trees vibrate at a 
slightly different frequency. So when you bring your body into contact with a tree, you actually, in essence, receive good vibrations. And it can help to balance your body. I wish I had some music to play. You know the song, good vibrations. Or every time you hug a tree, remember that song. But that's what will be happening to your body. Um, and I'll tell you a very quick uh, couple of tree hugging stories before we move on to uh, gardening. Uh, along, uh, a, a, a long um, side, Chatsworth Flower Show, this beautiful woodland and um, I was doing a talk there and I was really early and so I decided to go for a walk in the woods and there was nobody around, there was a gentle breeze and it was just absolutely beautiful morning and I decided to walk across this little stream and I went into the woods and I thought yeah I'll hug this tree and I was giving this tree a hug and then um, for the first time ever and I don't know why I've never really said it directly to a tree don't think I'm bonkers, but I said thank you because that's what I felt like doing when I was hugging the tree. These trees keep us alive. And so I said thank you. And the breeze took my thank you and it almost re like reverberated off all of the other trees. And I heard thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it was absolutely magical. I felt like I was thanking all of those trees. Um, and another time I was um, at a place called Mousehold Heath which is in Norwich where I am right now. And um, I was hugging a tree. No one was around. I wasn't, you know, no one there. It was autumn time. And you know the lovely spongy ground when all the leaves have fallen. I love that time of year. Um, obviously walking barefoot is amazing as well for grounding. And I took my shoes off and I hugged this tree. And uh, all of a sudden a lady appeared out of absolutely nowhere. And she said to me, are you okay? <laughs> and I just said, I'm fine, I'm hugging a tree. <laughs> and she kind of looked down and I had bare feet and there I was hugging a tree. So she probably thought I was crazy. Um, but another time at VegFest, I said this story and someone there put a hand up and she said, I hug trees at Mousehold Heath too. <laughs> so I think there's quite a lot of tree huggers out there, even in the same areas as you. So that's a beautiful way to find your connection with the natural world. We love trees. Another way, of course, to earth yourself is to uh, walk with Beth in bare feet like I was just saying mm. you know our feet are remarkable they're there to walk on the earth I love my shoes I won't not wear shoes when I'm out and about but sometimes take your shoes off and walk outside and walk on the lawn or walk on that lovely spongy earth because it's a great way to absorb that natural negative charge you know earthing is there at all times of the day and night and it's free we know that it can improve cognitive and emotional abilities. We know that countless studies have shown it has significant psychological and physiological improvements for health and well-being, um, both for adults and for children. We know it improves mental clarity. We know it decreases cardiovascular disease. So it's really important that we do make that connection with, um, with our amazing planet. So, one um, aspect, of course, of uh, earthing is gardening, because that's why we feel so good. We are constantly surrounded by plants and trees. Um, we are touching the soil, which is full of so much good bacteria. We know that it gives us happy hormones. It releases endorphins. Um, my back doesn't always feel like that when gardening. <laughs> And um, my hips have done 40 years of gardening now. Uh, so yeah, I feel it sometimes, but you can never be getting your hands dirty in the soil. If you sit on the earth and put your hands down, that's a great way to receive that balance of your bioelectrical system. Oh, and let's not forget, forget and swimming in salt water is also really, really good too. So over the years, social and therapeutic horticulture, which is, um, it's basically using plants and gardening to improve people's mental health and physical well-being, has actually been used since records began. Um, so it's surprising that over the past however many uh, centuries, we've kind of forgotten the importance of it. And 
I think now it's starting to come back around again, which is great. We're seeing much more promotion now of the benefits of gardening um, and that's um, being in the mainstream media now, which is helpful. There needs to be so much more of it. There's some doctors who are prescribing nature and gardening activities for well-being, especially for mental health well-being and um, before taking the steps of going on to uh, conventional medicines as well. So it's really good that it's becoming kind of more accepted again. But social and therapeutic horticulture is like we, we know the visual aesthetics of plants um, it can, can, it can give us a, a lovely feeling of like inner peace and happiness, you know, but actually coming into direct contact with plants is it kind of guides your focus away from like the stress of, you know, the crazy world that we're in and it brings you back into the moment. And I know we don't like to admit it but actually multitasking isn't very good for us. It's not good for our brains. It can stress us out. It, it increases our blood pressure um, and our heart rate. So actually focusing on one thing at a time is really good. And that's what gardening does so well. And that's what I love so much about gardening. Um, did you, when you think of the word paradise, do you think of a beach or, you know, the Caribbean and the blue sea? Well, paradise actually comes from an old Iranian word that meant a walled garden. So paradise is in fact a garden. And many years ago, um, gardening was used to help what was then called distressed souls. Um, and that's both by monks. And um, we've got many records of that, of gardening being used to help distressed souls who were, who were taken in to help. And, um, and even back to Egyptian times. Uh, so yeah, gardening is basically paradise. Um, and social and therapeutic horticulture is all about improving people's lives through gardening. So we know that gardening can improve stress. Uh, it raises self-esteem. It's good for our heart health. It lowers our stroke risk. Uh, risk it's uh, really good for hand strength and dexterity. So keeping your hands moving as much as you can. It keeps our brain very active. It's really good for our brain health. Um, studies have even shown recently that it reduces the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And that's really quite incredible. We know that it's good for depression um, and mental health, as I've said many times before. One, um, one thing is the Japanese have one of the highest life expectancies on the planet and that's because they love to garden but they focus on one thing at a time it's very calm gardening you know i don't know if you've ever you i mean if you've been to a japanese garden it's designed to calm you it's designed to calm the mind it takes you on a journey through pathways to surprise areas there's water flowing there's beautiful fragrance it's all about calming you and focusing on one thing at a time. And that's what's so very precious about gardening. Um, why is cultivating plants so, so important? Well, mainly uh, we can't eat, drink or breathe without plants. So quite often when I speak to someone, you know, people and say, oh, do you love plants? I love, you know, I'm a plant addict. I love plants. They're like, nah, I'm not really interested in plants. And I just think you realize you wouldn't be here without plants, right? We have a responsibility to respect and care for our natural world. And each of us can do that through gardening. And it doesn't matter what size space you have. It doesn't matter if you have a big garden or a balcony or a patio or a windowsill, we can still do something that has a great impact on our planet. You know, I always think that I've, had, um, I've lived in apartments with a balcony and apartments with out a balcony before and I've had herbs on windowsills and I can remember being in London in a high rise once and I'd grown herbs on a windowsill, opened the windows like every day it's so hot, it was so hot then and um, some bees came on the flowering basil and I'm in a high rise. And how did they know? How did they find it? It's absolutely incredible. But you, you know, that, that moment that that bee, you know, enjoyed the nectar from those plants was magical for me. But for the bee, you know, you've actually changed that bee's life. It's been able to feed and it's been able to pollinate. So even small things have really great impact. Um, and daily gardening activities, of course, are also a great way to keep your uh, physical exercise up so it can be as gentle or as hardcore as you like. Yesterday it was hardcore for me. I 
garden no dig and I created some new beds and I had to uh, shovel a load of um, mulch into wheelbarrows and wheel it quite far and then mulch the beds and I was aching last night but there is nothing like that satisfied aching feel after gardening for the day is there. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you some quick plant facts because these I love this kind of stuff being a complete plant addict that I think will interest you. We actually have over nearly 400,000 species of vascular plant. Uh, a vascular plant is a plant that's able to transport minerals and water throughout itself in order to survive. 94% of those plants are flowering plants, so lucky us. We don't see them, of course, all in our gardens, but that's a lot of flowering plants. Um, and every single year we find around about 2,000 new species of plants. And that's incredible. And there is so much research that goes on behind the scenes to find out what the new species of plants are, um, what, how they can help us like medically as well. There was recently a new plant discovered uh, in, I think it was West Africa, and it's discovered by researchers from Kew here in the UK and um, when they took it back and took a look at it they found that it has potential really strong cancer fighting properties so that's quite remarkable isn't it and um, they called it the Kindia Gangang after the name of the village that was close by that just uh, sprung to mind so we actually have nearly 18,000 plant species that have a medicinal use 18,000 and a quarter of all conventional drugs prescribed are actually uh, based on um, medicinal plants. So there's many plants that are actually, we wouldn't go and eat, so I definitely don't go and eat any of these plants I'm now going to talk about, because they would not make you very well. But we have conventional drugs on the market that um, help Alzheimer's, um, but they're actually based on snowdrops and um, snowflakes and daffodils. Yeah, so that's in Alzheimer's drugs. And also we know never to eat foxglove. Don't go and do that. That's a dreadful thing to do. But used with conventional medicine in the right way, they actually treat um, arrhythmia. So you will find if you do have um, arrhythmia, that foxgloves may actually be part of your conventional medicine. So we're using plants a lot already um, and I always question how much we need to jump onto conventional medicine without trying plant medicine first. So I use conventional medicine absolutely, I mean it's saved our species many times over, we wouldn't be here without it. But there are definitely ways that you can minimise um, inflammation and disease and viruses and illness through using plants first. And actually it's quite empowering to grow your own plants for your own health purposes. So not only are you grounding yourself, you're earthing yourself and you're getting all of that amazing benefits that gardening gives you, but you're also growing plants to help with your own health issues. So if you suffer from headaches, you could perhaps grow some lavender and uh, make your own lavender oil and use that on your temples just to calm your headache down. Um, there's all kinds of different things like calendula is amazing. Calendula, I know somebody who used calendula cream after trying every single different conventional way possible to get rid of varicose veins on her legs and she used calendula cream and that got rid of her varicose veins. So I think it's an empowering process to think about what issues you have and um, grow those specific plants, you know, absorb all of that lovely natural energy out there and then use the plants uh, to help you. I must say at this point, of course, you should always check with your doctor before you do use any, especially if you're already on any medication, and always do allergy tests and make sure that they're okay for you to use. Um, 
Of course, we have loads of plants in cosmetics as well. Um, natural cosmetics can actually be traced all the way back to ancient Egypt. Uh, we know that Cleopatra was rumoured to be the most beautiful woman who ever walked the planet. She actually wrote a cosmetics book. Yeah, she actually wrote down what she used to use on her skin. So we know that she used to use aloe vera, olive oil, aloe vera, olive oil and avocado and she'd mix it up and put it on her skin and uh, yeah she was rumored to have the most beautiful skin so there you go <laughs> and of course historically plants were the only cosmetics they were the only way to dye fabrics they were the only way to treat illnesses so we have a huge amount to learn from uh, documents and research of, um, of you know, how plants have been used long before we came along and uh, decided that they were all our own. Um, so many plants are used in cosmetics. I've mentioned aloe vera, rose, uh, rose water, of course, is a lovely tonic for your face. It's a good toner. Um, I have often said that gardeners work really hard and even if you're not a gardener and you've worked really hard or you just need to calm down and relax um, just chuck some rose petals in the bath I know it sounds very extravagant you know but honestly the oils from just slightly crushed rose petals in your bath and you absorb all of that amazing fragrance and all the goodness from the oil will really relax you so roses are incredible if you try to pick one with a fragrance that you love of course that would be even better one of my favorite roses is saint ethelberger i absolutely love that beautiful stunning fragrance um, another one is corezia which is a bright yellow rose and Corezia has a really sweet fragrance which is totally beautiful and that's a lovely toner so I love using that like a toner and um, of course lavender um, is used in so many different cosmetics and medicines as well easy to grow loads of different varieties you can have white ones pink ones you know our, our well-known ones Hidcoat and Munstead can all be used too um, an easy way to use that if you are tired or you're not sleeping very well or you need to de-stress is just to dry the flowers by hanging them upside down and then pop them into a little uh, fabric pouch and put them underneath your pillow. Um, I do love lavender but too much of it so I use it on my temples um, and I've made little pouches from it before but too much of it reminds me of my nanny's bedroom. <laughs> it's a lovely memory but all of her clothes used to smell of lavender so I love how plants can also bring back lovely lovely memories so planting in your garden like a sensory kind of garden where there's plants that you can touch that are so tactile that there's sounds like the rustle of grasses and um, things that you can taste so edible plants like thinking about your plant-based diet and actually using edible flowers um, you know just using all of your senses in a, in a sensory garden is immensely good for well-being um, and planting anything that brings back great memories can only make you smile so it's so good for your well-being you know if you've got married and you had peonies in your bouquet try and grow some peonies um, I can always remember I mentioned before my uncle's garden um, he always used to grow marigolds as companion plants and so I always grow marigolds not least because they're great for deterring aphids but also because it reminds me of those lovely happy days running around uh, barefoot in his garden taking caterpillars of cabbages. So we can use plants and gardening to bring back good memories. So if we're feeling down or stressed or depressed or we have some anxiety, breathing in the fragrance and looking at something that brings you really good memories is very, very good for you. So other plants, of course, many herbs are used in cosmetics, rosemary, basil, chamomile, one of my favorites. Um, 
I think at this point it would be really remiss for me to miss out the benefits of houseplants. When you are a plant addict, it doesn't just stop in the garden or on the allotment. <laughs> it's also in the home. Um, I have a jungle of plants in my house, uh, but we know that they're so good for clearing the air of common toxins that we breathe in. And it was actually NASA who found out, uh, who were the first to find out, in fact, um, how beneficial houseplants were for us. Um, and uh, this is a Sansevieria here in the corner. This is a snake plant. Absolutely love this. Um, it's also called mother-in-law's tongue. And that's because it's long and sharp down the edges. <laughs> so um, Sansevieria is a, an amazing plant for clearing toxins out of the air. And NASA put one into a room uh, the size of just a normal living room and they sealed it off. And for 24 hours, they pumped toxins, all the common toxins that we breathe in. Toxins that come from fabrics, toxins that come from uh, like print cartridges, all kinds of things. And uh, they discovered that this one plant in 24 hours reduced benzene levels by 53% and trichloroethylene by 13.4%. Just 24 hours, one plant. So not only do we know that they are aesthetically beautiful and they can soften a room, but we know that having them around reduces anxiety and stress again. We know in an office environment that they actually increase productivity and motivation, but they are working really hard all around us to clear the air of toxins, which of course is also really great for our well-being. Um, this here is a a crassula, so this is a jade plant, or known as a money plant as well. It's never brought me any money luck yet, but it's meant to bring you good luck if you have one. This is a beautiful plant for um, a house plant for clearing the air of toxins. Often plants with big foliage is really good as well. So there's so many ways that we can use plants for our own well-being outside and inside. Um, I could go on, but I'm just conscious of the time. So I'm wondering if there are any questions. Uh, one of the things, um, uh, sorry. Oh, somebody's asking, uh, Julia is asking uh, if a good way to get into social and therapeutic horticulture, what uh, events or courses would you um, recommend? Yeah, okay, so social and therapeutic horticulture is just one of the most wonderful things to study. Um, it, it, I think it helps you as well with yourself, but then you can pass that information on to help so many other people too. Um, there's an organization called Thrive, and Thrive have a lot of free resource online and where you can go and download information, but they also do online courses and distance learning courses as well. They're a charity themselves. Um, they run gardens around the UK where people can go and work in the garden for their own well-being so that's the people with learning disabilities physical disabilities mental health issues um, so that's thrive and i think it's thrive.org online um, and they're a marvelous charity and um, a, a whole resource of information so that's where i would um suggest going to also, if you were to uh, contact like your local community gardens, growing initiatives, that can be a really good way as well to get in touch with people who are doing things locally. One of the things I wanted to ask personally is, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about No Dig? I'm really interested in that. <laughs> yes, no dig. no dig has revolutionized the way I grow. So I have been digging for 40 years. <laughs> And a couple of years ago, I was reading a book by Charles Dowding about no dig. And I thought, okay, this, this looks interesting. And then I took on a new allotment a couple of years back and I was running out of time and, you know, life was just so busy. I thought, right, this is the time to do it. This is the time to give no dig a try. Essentially what it is, is allowing nature to do the digging for you. So it's replenishing the soil and allowing the worms 
and all the you know, bacteria and everything that's going on underneath the soil to take the mulch that you lay on top down into the soil. You don't dig it. So we know that after so many centuries of agriculture, we are destroying soil. And of course, without soil, there's no life on earth. So we can actually start by replenishing our own soil in our own gardens and allotments by doing no dig. So I recommend um, looking up Charles Dowding. Um, and it's basically what it says on the tin no dig you keep replenishing the soil with a an organic mulch and um, you can use animal manures garden compost I'm vegan so I don't even use animal manure on my plot I use my own garden compost or I use um, something called plant grow which is uh, basically it's made of maize it's like a mulch but in it, it smells like animal manure as well <laughs> and, and I lay that onto my allotment and um, once a year, I give it another mulch, and that's all I do. And it is incredible. Mm, I'll have to give that a go. Um, the other thing is, what is your own garden like? Or, I mean, I know you have an allotment. Is Do you have a garden at home as well? Yeah, so I've... Um, I've we lived in a house in the countryside until about two years ago and I'd established a lovely garden over 11 years and then we had to move because of my husband's job and we now live in the city. So I have a front garden which I am, I mean I'm so happy to have that front garden, I mean it, it's rare to have a garden like that in the city and it's all planted for pollinators so I have verbena and salvias and achillea and um, rudbeckias, uh, Coreopsis, sedums, all sorts of things to um, help uh, pollinators throughout the year. And then I have a back garden, um, which we I only moved to about a month ago. So at the moment, it's a uh, uh, it's all patio it the whole thing is paved over and i've just put all of my pots on it so it's just full of pots and containers and plants and fruit trees and all kinds of things but there is definitely room for changing that <laughs> have any tips for people who do just grow in containers yeah i don't be restricted by a container ever um i've gardened in containers over the years many times obviously um there are numerous varieties new varieties of plants that are now coming out um who that can be grown in containers because the industry is recognizing how many people especially live in urban areas and how important it is to bring greenery into cities so what i would recommend is chuck the rule books out for a start and grow whatever you love and see how it goes that's all part of the experiment i've grown things in pots that the theory would say would never grow and they've grown brilliantly obviously they dry out much quicker than if plants are growing in a border so water is essential if you can do any rainwater harvesting store water in your garden that's great as well so you can kind of be self-sufficient with your water um, as we go forward if you can pick plants perhaps that um, don't need so much water that can be helpful so succulents that kind of thing um, and over the winter time raise them up on feet if you can or bricks to just um, allow better drainage. Um, and just, I think that one of the most important things about container gardening is keeping well on top of pests and diseases. So if there's any uh, sign that there's disease or any pests, when you're in, in containers, it spreads much, much quicker. So just keep a check on your plants every single day. And if you see something, just uh, remove it. And do you grow uh, vegetables in containers as well, or just plants and flowers? Yeah, yeah, I pretty much almost, not always, but almost everything I grow is edible because I just love that process of growing something and then you being able to harvest it as well. So yeah, I have salads in pots. Um, I have beans in pots. I have squash in pots. I've grown rhubarb in grow, grow bags. I've got apricot trees in pots. Uh, fig trees, of course, they love being in pots anyway, but fig trees. So yeah, um, go, yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Try, try anything. That's all part of the fun. Well, um, thank you very much if anybody else has got any questions, but... Um, I actually just want, sorry, it, it's that secret voice. I'm, I'm, I'm here, but I'm just uh, quite, quite interested. Um, still about the tree hugging. Um, sorry, I might just, might, might just move a bit. Um, so are there um, any specific trees that you would recommend for hugging? And, and does the size, the age matter? Any, any more information on, on that? 
And that's a really interesting question, actually, because many people say to me, how do you know which tree to hug? Well, from an emotional perspective, you just know. So if you're walking around and you spot some trees, you'll think, oh, I'm going to give that one a hug. For some reason, that one I'm drawn more to. I, um, I think there's a, book, there's, a, there's a book called Earthing, and I think that would help answer some of those questions. It's a brilliant book. It's all about, you know, the science behind how all of this works. I think it really depends on your own preference. I have spoken to many people whilst researching for the book um, that's being released next year about the science behind the different types of trees. I don't think we can find anything that suggests an older tree or a younger tree is better. But I can say that from my own experience that an older, bigger tree is perhaps you connect more with it. Okay. Yeah. There was there was another kind of interesting thing. Um, I've actually tried that myself, and it's I, I don't know. If this is just in mind how it works, but with the grounding, one of the and that might be a tip for, for for the people that are listening. One of the ways of getting over jet lag is if you if you if you're going to a different country and there's quite a bit of a difference in in time, so you obviously get quite tired. One of the things you should do first is actually do a grounding. So walk bare feet if you can, uh, and, and do a bit of meditation in areas where, where, where the time difference is quite, quite bad. And you really can get over the jet lag um, much quicker. So I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm oh, that, that's a, that is that, an amazing so. tip. Do you know, I've, I've never considered that. But actually, when you think about it, yeah. when, you, when you come into contact with a tree, it helps to bring your, your balance. You know, yeah, it, that's exactly that. Balance, yeah. you know, it's a vibrational experience and when you travel and you go to different time zones so, you know you will feel out of balance and yeah. so actually that that's a really really good that's a that's a really good suggestion i'm going to try that next time i try that <laughs> <laughs> <Very much. laughs> um, lovely okay yeah but it was really fascinating thank you so much it was uh your your talk was you know, definitely uh, put some ideas into my head. Um, I'm going to have a look at Charles Dowding's book. About no yeah, uh, yeah, he's great. He's just won a load of awards as well at the Grow Your Own Awards this year. So um, I, I think it's really changing the way people are growing their own food and gardening. Um, it's actually based on a very old theory. Um, and I think it was a lady called Ruth Stout. So if you look up her as well, um, I think that's where it all started. But Charles has some great books, um, very instructional, very informational, and it's so easy is all I can say. But the key is always gonna be in producing compost because you're gonna need a lot of it. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. So yeah, thanks again to Ellen and thanks for everybody for joining us. Um, uh, I hope you're booked onto other events and the Flower Power Festival and um, I hope you're going to check out Ellen's website and the things that she does in various different media. Um, also, if you have a look on our website, thecharterhouse.org, um, you can sign up to our newsletter and find out about other events that are going on beyond the Flower Power Festival. We're also on social media, so you can have a look at our Twitter and our Instagram. But otherwise, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Go and hug a tree. Go and hug a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.
Thanks. Thanks for having me. I had fun. <laughs> <laughs>